I want to encourage you. I really do want to encourage you to be here Sunday. Sunday I'm going to be speaking of a passage in John chapter 8. Um, John chapter 8 is the woman who was taken in the act of adultery. And a lot of versions, if you look at your Bible, they'll say, and maybe at some point a little asterisk, that this was not in, originally in, in some of the older manuscripts. And we're going to talk about why it wasn't in the Bible at the beginning. Why it wasn't in the original manuscripts. But we're, we're, going, to, we're going to really talk about how all of us carry around baggage. She was caught in the act of, can you imagine the shame that she felt? I mean, can you imagine the shame that this woman was in front of the in front of the the, the same Jesus that she had heard all these miraculous things about. She was brought before Him unclothed in complete shame. We're going to talk about what that passage doesn't talk about. I'm going to think about that. There's something that's missing. We're going to talk about that on Sunday too. It's really blazing and it's unbelievable that it's missing from that. But what the whole premise is of Sunday mes- Sunday's message is is that we all carry guilt, we all carry shame, shame, and that chains us sometimes. Because even though we've asked God to forgive us for it, there's other people who won't let us outlive it. They want to keep reminding us. Paul dealt with the same thing. We're going to talk about how we can let go of those chains, those shackles that hold us down. And how God has allowed us not only to be freed from the sin, but to move on and live a life outside of that sin. So I really want to encourage you to be here this Sunday. I want you to please be much in prayer. I'm excited about that. But tonight, I'm excited about being here talking to 1 John and to you about 1 John. Let's go to 1 John, and we're going to, we're going to finish this tonight. If we're going to stay here all night, we're going to finish this. These just six verses. Uh, we began this two... This is our third week in these six in these particular verses, and, and I do I do want to read it. There's a lot of magic in reading the Word of God. I mean, really. It says, "Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God." Verse five. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sin, and there's no sin in. Anyone who continues to live in Him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know Him or understand who He is. Verse 7 of 1 John 3. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they're righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when, people, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sin. Let me just stop right here on that particular verse. What makes us think that all we have to do is say a few words and go to a church and maybe even join that church and we're righteous. What gives us the right to justify, to remember what we talked about last week, categorize and then justify our sin? You know, the woman taken in the act of adultery, there were people that said, oh my goodness, I can't believe she did that. But in order for them to take her out of the act of adultery, they had to watch her do what she was doing, which no doubt tells me that there was lust involved in their eyes. The woman was taken from the act of adultery, but where was the man who was involved with it? See, they were willing to point out her sin, but completely were oblivious to the sin that they committed. And I'm amazed at how churches have become manufacturers of Christians who have categorized sin but live in it daily with no conviction because we have justified it as that's just what everybody does. Remember this past Sunday we talked about complete obedience and how Saul was almost obedient? You know, we, we, we see kids who say, I want to serve the Lord. I even use this illustration. I, and I love God. And they're reading the Bible. We go, wow, that's a great kid. And, and, and they're singing. And they're, wow, that's a great kid. And they're preaching. We go, wow, that's a great kid. That's a crazy good kid. And then they go home and they completely disrespect their parents. That is not right. It's not. 
We, we've got men who, who serve in positions and, and have a moral code about them and don't talk about one another and, and give financially to the church and work hard in, in this country to, to promote a, a, a moralistic system of values and then they go home behind closed doors and they search the internet and their minds are perverted by pornography. We've got women who want to talk about the Proverbs 31 lady, but yet when someone falls, instead of lifting them up, they push them down even further. What's wrong with us? I've got a prayer journal, and my prayer journal at the very bottom, I've got these, these names. I incorporate not all, but some of these names in my, into my monthly prayer journal. You know, we have the ones that are sent out. I've got little notebooks, little dollar notebooks from the dollar store. That's all it is. Nothing fancy. And I divide it each month into four categories. And I've got my family, which is a definite everyday thing. I've got those who are going through some serious physical battles right now. Jack Neal is one of the top of the list. There are other people that I know and love that are going through very difficult things right now. Then we've got some that are going through surgeries and their difficult surgeries and their sickness and all these things. And so we're praying for them. And then we've got one section for the staff. But at the very bottom, right across the whole thing, is for God to revive our people. And I want God to do a, a, a revitalization in the hearts of my life, my family, my church family, so much so that we have a hunger just to hear from Him. That we really can't wait. Now this may sound crazy, but just can't wait to get home and, and get all the kids settled down to open this book and read it. Just to see what He's got to say to me. Just to see what he said. I mean, right, an excitement about the Word of God. We have become so visually stimulated that the Word of God has kind of lost its flavor. <coughs> or at least that's what we tell ourselves. But I can tell you the Word of God has absolutely not lost its flavor. We have lost our vision. And so he says in verse 9, and we're going to get back, he says, Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because some versions use the word God's seed. Some versions like the New Living Translation use the word God's life is in them. So they can't, they can't keep on sinning. Not they choose not to, but they can't keep on sinning. You know, you ever see the small children when you tell them to do something? Like, yeah. <laughs> Pick up your room. Yeah. 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 You know, and like, stop. You can. You just don't want to do it. I'll pick it up. That's kind of the Christian mentality today. Oh, God, I can't serve you. God, I can't read the Bible. God, I can't love others. I just see that mentality of, of, of Christians today that say, I can't do it. What we need to say is, God, I love you so much, I can't sin like this anymore. I can't do it because my spirit cries out when I sin because it doesn't belong in my life because my life is in you, God. Then he says in verse 10, and this is how we start it off every week, and this really is the beginning of it all. So now we can tell who are children of God. That's what this cross is symbolic of. And those who are children of the devil. And I just put that little circle because I didn't really know how to draw the devil. Anyone who does not live right and does not love others does not belong to God. Now I know we spent some time on verse 10, but I can I read this one more time? If you have, a, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, your Bible, your notebook, I want you to look at this verse. Two things. Anyone who does not live right. That's a pretty generic statement. It's a pretty broad statement. Let me rephrase it. I'm sorry. It means, and we've talked about this, who does not practice living right. Doesn't mean you're not going to fall, stumble, make up, mess up, or do wrong. It means anybody who doesn't make a day-to-day -day practice. Today I'm getting up and I'm going to live a right life. That's what the word righteous means. It means a right life. Anyone who does not live right, and look at this. 
Look at this here. And does not love other. And I love the way the New Living Translation spells it out. Other believers. And you say, well, we're supposed to love the lost. We are, but this is a different type of love. This is a binding love, a bonding love. This is a type of love that says, I may not agree with you, and you may not do anything for me, but I'm going to love you anyway. If you do not, and where's my, let me find my little, here we go. <coughs> if we do not live, look at this, I want to put it here so we can see, if we do not live right, and we do not love, I'm going to put, uh, CB, Christian believers, okay? Not others. He didn't say everybody. He didn't say if you didn't love the world. He said if we don't love Christians, now you've got to let this sink in. Because here's what we teach today by the way we live our life. You can love other Christians until they're hard to love. That's what we teach. As long as you and I agree and we're getting along and along, you know, really what we here's what most Christians should say should say. I will love you as long as you do everything that pleases me. And when you stop doing things to please me, I'm not going to love you again. Now that sounds really nasty, don't it? But if you're honest, and if I'm honest, we can just take off that Christian jumpsuit that we wear every Sunday. That is the mentality that every one of us struggle with sometimes. I will love you as long as you give me a reason to love you. And God says if that is our mentality, and that is our soul mentality, then we're not living in Him. Tonight we're going to pick up from where we left off so we can finish this. And, and just for brevity, just in brevity, I want to say that we talked about in verse 4 uh, that foundationally, everything that sin is, God is nothing. So if, if this is, if I want to draw another great picture, okay? That's me. Huh? If, if this is, if this is who I am, okay? Now I want you to watch this because there's a reason I'm doing this. And all of this right here belongs to God. All of this belongs to God. Am I completely God? You know why I'm not completely God? Because this right here is still under my control. Now that may be a juvenile, you know, just illustration. Here's what's happening. I told you this before. The old hymn that simply says, all to Jesus I surrender should have been changed years ago to most of what I am to Jesus I surrender. Most of what I am I somewhat give. I will try to most of the time trust and serve Him in His presence most of the time I live. I surrender most. I surrender most. Most to Jesus I surrender I surrender most. Now that doesn't flow quite as good as the other version, but I think we'd be a little more honest with ourselves if that's the version we saw. He says <coughs> that if we are a believer, and I want to read that verse one more time too, foundation, that even this right here, if that's my, if this is what I'm struggling with, it is contrary, completely contrary to God. So I can say that I'm serving God, but if I am sinning, if there's a part of my life that I'm not willing to surrender, then I am in opposition to God. You know, there's a lot of people you want to be in opposition to, and there's a lot of people you don't want to be in opposition to. And God is one of those you don't want to be in opposition to. You know? You're hoping that the guy that pulls you on the side of the road because you're going fast, you're hoping that he's a friend, not a foe. You're hoping that he's not one in the line you cut off at Walmart when you had 50 things and he had one pack of gum and you wouldn't let him in front of you. You're hoping he's not the guy that pulls you over and that he remembers because you don't want to cross him, especially when you're in jeopardy of getting a ticket. We do not want to be in opposition of God. Yet many Christians, watch this, we live a life that is in opposition to God and we wonder where God is when we pray. 
Think about this for a minute. If I am living a life that is opposition to God, what gives me the right to think I can go to God for His favor and gain it all the while living totally opposite of who He is? Number three, we talked about Jesus came to remove the burden of sin. Remember we used the phrase to take away? It means that sin has a grip on us and instead of ripping that sin away from us, what He does, He loosens it and then He removes it. We spent time and that's where we ended last week. Look at verse 6. I'm going to read that to you. Verse 6 says, Anyone who continues to live in Him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know Him or understand who He is. That can be a scary verse and it's created a lot of problems for people. Because they ask the question, how can I not live in sin? Let's look at the first. This verse is divided into two groups. Let's look at the first group, those that live in Him. It simply says, those that live in Him will not keep sinning. I know that that may not be the best time. Will not keep sinning. Now, if we look at that and we do not study that, that would really and truly just completely get rid of all of us because I'll be honest with you, since I've been saved, I have sinned. Have you? <coughs> the phrase can be translated, and I want to read this to you with this, at verse 6. Anyone who continues to live in Him will not keep on keeping on sin. That's what it means. The point is not that you and I will not sin. The point is that we will not continue to live or dwell in the sin. It says anyone living in Him. Now I don't want you to follow these steps if you could. I wish I had a cleaner board that I could write it. If we are in Him, or if we love Him, if we are in Him, or if we love Him, what do you do with people you love? What, what, are, what, are, what is a quality that uh, you have? When, when I want to get to know someone. When I love someone, I desire to spend time with that person. Right? Guys start dating. Girls start dating. You know, they just want to spend all the time in the world with their new boyfriend, right? Quality time. Yeah, quantity time when they first start dating. Right? I want every minute I can with them. Hey, how you doing? I'm on the phone for four hours talking to them. Listen, I don't know if I've talked that much to one person in a year or so. But they want to spend time with them. So watch this. If we are in Him, if we love Jesus, then our reaction should be we want to spend time with Him. Correct? Because when you love someone, you desire to spend time with Him. We don't want to rush through the reading. We don't want to rush through prayer. We may spend five minutes. We may spend 20 minutes doing these things. But we just want to spend some time with God. When we spend time with Christ, when we spend time with other people, we begin to take their attributes. Do you understand that? When you spend time with people, you begin to act and talk like they do. Many men and women say, I struggle at work because I'm with these people 40 and 50 hours a week and they use this profane language and it's in my subconscious and sometimes when I, I get mad, things come out that normally do not come out because I spend so much time with people like this. When we spend time with God because we love Him, then we're going to act like Him. The more we act, like him, the one we had studied two weeks ago that came to remove sin and remove the burden of sin, the more we will sin, no more. Now you've got to see this. You can't take one of these steps out and be successful. If we, it starts with spending time with God, not spending time with, with our favorite CD or our favorite book or, or our favorite speaker. It's spending time with God. How do you spend time with God? They're reading His Word. But guys, we, we, have, we have really almost completely kicked out personal devotional worship in our life. We want other people to read it and explain it to us. But in order for us to get to know Him, we've got to personally spend time with Him. It doesn't matter what degree I have in my office. It doesn't matter what degree I'm pursuing. Degrees are nothing if I spend no time with Him. So the more I spend in His Word, the more I spend in prayer, the more I'm going to start acting and taking on the heart of God. You know, when you're, when you're reading His Word, it's extremely hard to sin. 
It, it, it is, absolutely, when you're reading to, to, to spend time with it, because there are people who read His Word a lot and know His Word that don't have a relationship with His Word, and they find it very easy to see. There are people I know can quote the Bible better than I can. They have no belief in God. It's, a, it's the intimacy. So the more I am intimate with God's Word and talking to God, the more I'm going to act like Him, and the more that I act like Him the more it's going to be, as you said, harder for me to sin. What did David say in Psalms 119? He said, I've taken your word, God, and I've stored it in my heart. How do you store God's word in your heart? Memorize it. Reading it. Over and over and over and over and over reading it. He says, I've stored it in my heart. What was the purpose? So he could quote it to people when they didn't know? I, he said. He didn't say, I've stored my word in your heart so when you mess up, I can make you feel bad. He said, I've stored it in my heart so I don't sin. What does Ephesians tell us that when we're in a spiritual battle, not with hands and feet, when we're in a spiritual battle, the only weapon we have to defend ourselves is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You guys sound like you've been to church sometime in your life. <laughs> So here's what he said. He's giving you two groups here in verse 6. He says, if you live in Him, what's this? You're going to act like Him. Huh? If you have a relationship with God, you're going to act like you've got a relationship with God. There's an old saying that I have in the front of one of my oldest Bibles. When I first got saved, this pastor sold me this Bible. And I think he ripped me off, but that's okay. I didn't know any better. And it's got somebody else's name on it. Clyde Pickery or something like that. The first Bible I ever had, it was a study body. It's like, oh, you need to have this. And I forgot I was working. I gave him money. I'd, but on the front of it, I had a little piece of paper taped in it. said, live so that when you tell someone else you're a Christian, it only confirms their suspicion and never surprises them. What a statement. Because if I'm going to say I love God and that He is in me, then my life should show by the way I act. If you are a believer, then you are not going to make a practice of sinning. It's impossible. Look at the second part of this verse. He says, But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know Him and does not understand Him. How can we not sin? Let me, let me share something with you that I love about this verse. When it says he does not know him. Does some of your Bibles have the word no union? They have no union with him? Anybody have that version? Yours? Remain in union? That's what yours has? Okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah, it says reunion. The word is union. He actually translates union. This is really, really cool. He says in the New Living Translation, I'll read it, verse 6, but anyone who keeps on sinning has no union or does not know Him. The word is a marital term. He says the person that keeps on sinning cannot be married to God. I'm going to tell you what that makes. What hair I have left, it makes it stand up on my head. You cannot be married to God and have a continuous relationship with sin. We will not be comfortable enough to live with that sin without trying to get it out of our lives. I want to make this real simple. Verse 6 is a powerful verse and we can spend weeks and weeks and weeks in it. He says, if you are a Christian, then you're going to be like Him. You're going to act like Him and the, the same reason He died a horrible death was to take away sin because He abhors it. He, he, he defends God. He despises sin. He says, you're going to have the same mentality because you spent enough time with Him. You're going to take on His attributes. But if you have a lifestyle that keeps on living this sinful life with no remorse with no effort to get rid of it, then not only do you not have a marriage with Christ, Christ, you've never met Christ. That's scary. That is, like I've said before, what we talk about on Wednesday nights, they are not best-selling books. 
These are not self-help, make you feel better, I am good and I love me. These are not that type of books. The phrase, you do not understand Him, is just simply saying, you can't, don't you know you can't live in Christ and live in sin at the same time? Okay, this is scary because I do sin. Please, don't let this confuse you. Do I sin? Yes. Let me tell you what happens when I sin. The Holy Spirit convicts me when I sin. To the point that if I'm somewhere and I tell somebody, hey, uh, I'll, I'll give you a good illustration how the Lord did something to me, maybe it looks stupid, but that's okay. <laughs> we make it a practice here when someone comes to the church, we have the food and things like We don't hand out money. We do not do that. Because people will manipulate, and I have seen it, and we have worked with it, and we've caught it many times. We've got to be good stewards of God's money. I walk outside the other day to me and Kevin he said, hey man, how you doing? He said, hey, I I'm thinking about coming to church here because you know that's one of the first things they say. I'm going to come to church here and see you guys. I said, great, love to have you. Hey, by the way, I need, I, I need some money. I need to get a prescription. I need to get gas in my car. I need to get whatever the case may be, diapers for my baby. It's always an excuse. And they say, can I get some money? I said, look man, we don't give money out here. Besides, I don't have a dime on me. And I usually don't. If you know me, I don't carry money on me. My wife had given me $5 earlier that day. I went inside my office and I said, man, I don't have any money on me. I said, I don't know why. And I said, oh my goodness. And I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit convicted me. So I walked right back out that door and I said, hey man, come here. I said, I lied to you and I didn't mean to. I said, I do have $5 in my wallet. And I said, I just, you know, here, take it. It was $5. That's all it was. I would have told him, even if I had money, yes, I got money, but I, I, I don't give money out. I don't mind telling somebody that, not at all. But the fact that I told him something, even though it was unintentional. See, a lie, I believe, is when you intentionally mislead somebody. When you unintentionally do that. But see, I had the opportunity to correct it. And the Holy Spirit said, look, it's $5 worth. You knowing you misled him. Well, you knowing now that you misled him and him still being out there in that driveway. And let me tell you something, $5 is not worth the guilt of knowing that I have hurt God. <clears throat> I can't live in it and be happy. Can I sin? Yes. Do I sin? Yes. But the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me screams out and says, This does not belong here. I want you to be like me. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. The same sin that made God turn His back on His Son is the same one you just participated in. You've got a choice. Is it your pride? Is it what others are going to think of you? Is it something that you personally want? Is that more important than getting this garbage out of your life? So He says that when God is in me, then yes, we are going to sin, but it cannot feel comfortable in our lives. It has no home there. This is not a good people go to heaven lesson. This is that if you're truly saved, then your life is going to show it. Lesson. And then the tale of two people, and I'll make it simple, verses 7 through 9. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous. That makes sense, don't it? When people do what is bad, it shows they are baddest. Bad, baddest, B-A-D-E-O-U-S. I don't know how to say what the word would be. They're bad people. Righteous live right. Baddest people live bad. <laughs> But when people keep on sinning, look at this. This is I, I highlighted this. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil. Guys, that should concern every one of us. I want my kids to know this. I want my kids to know that just because our dad's a pastor and they grew up in church doesn't mean that they're right with God. Doesn't mean that they're saved. I want them to know this. I want them to know that their life is not dependent upon their dad or their mom or the church they've been affiliated with. Their life depends on them submitting individually to Christ. 
It says that if a Christian is a Christian, then they are going to live like a Christian. And if a Christian or if a man is not a Christian, then he's not going to live like the Christian. In other words, a person cannot live like the devil and be born of God. People keep on sinning. It shows they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. What an awesome statement here. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. There are people that say they're Christians. But they belong to the devil. You know that John, the Gospels, they reaffirm that when they say, many will come to me that day and say, Lord, Lord. Lord, 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 I know you. Lord, I know you. He says, no, I never knew you. What did, the, what did the verse say just before that? It says they do not know who He is. Two simple notes found in verses 7 and 8. There are people that live right and they belong to God. Now, let me just say this. Living right in this passage does not mean they live a perfect life. It means they live a life that acts like God. And then there are people who keep practicing the same sin over and over and over. You know what Jesus told the woman when she was taken from the act of adultery? What did He tell her then? He says, where are those people that condemned you? You know what I find is crazy about that passage? You know that's the only time in the New Testament where you see Jesus writing anything? What do you write it with? It's his finger, right? Remember in uh, Daniel? Belshazzar was sitting down and saw the handwriting on the wall. Man, that's crazy when you start putting that together. He said, where are these people that accused you? And she looked around and she said, they're not here. I don't see them. They're gone. Whatever she said. And he says, I don't condemn you either. We like to stop with that. He says, I forgive you. That's what he's saying. But he throws a caveat in. But now you go and live a right life. Do you think she sinned from that point on? You think she did something wrong before she died? Yeah. Maybe she lied. Maybe she took, had an indiscretion. Maybe she made a bad judgment. Maybe she took something she didn't uh, should have taken. Maybe she got angry with somebody. But there's no doubt she sinned before she died. So the, if, if that's the case, and we can assume rightly so that she sinned, then she was not forgiven if it means that you can never sin. No. Here's what Jesus said. He said, I've forgiven you, but this sin of adultery that you've been participating in, don't participate in as a practice anymore. That's the key. He didn't say you can never sin. People say, oh, Jesus told her to go and sin never again. No, He did not do that. He came to die to save us from our sins. And that is what a believer is told to do when they sin is repent. So repentance would be necessary if we would no longer sin. He is saying to us in John, in John chapter 8, just like He's saying in 1 John, He said that as a believer, then we're going to act like Him. And He hated sin so much, He gave His life. And if we're believers, then when sin and it will come into our lives, we're going to hate it so much. Now watch this. That we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of our life. Embarrassing. Making things right. Asking forgiveness. We're willing to do what it takes to get rid of that sin because even though we may even though we will sin as a Christian, we cannot keep living in it. In verse 9, and that's it. Those who have been born into God's family do, do not make a practice of sinning. What if some of you have in that particular verse? Because God's what? Life. Life. Anybody have anything different in life? Seed. That's two words. I think this is really cool because the word life and the word seed is basically where we kind of get our word DNA from. 
He says, anyone who... And you know what? He keeps saying the same thing over and over and over. Anyone who keeps on sinning does not have God's life, God's seed, or we can more today accurately say God's DNA coursing through us. Remember, it was a boy Povich, that was what he did all the time. Uh, he did the little thing, we had the letters, and he said, You are not the Father. Remember that? Is that the one that said the same guy years ago? He still does? Okay, so, you know, here's what he's saying. Can, can you just imagine if we had time today, I got my little suit on, I got the, the envelope, and, and we said, okay, you're a Christian? Oh, hold on, the DNA results are you are not a Christian. God is not your father because the DNA shows you are not related to him. He's saying this over and over and over. Man, let's close with a good note. He's saying that if we are truly saved, that we're going to act like him. We are going to sin. We are going to do wrong. But because of God's DNA makeup in us, the same Christ that hated sin, the same God that hated sin so much, that sent His Son to die on the cross that came to remove the burden of sin, when we do sin, we are not going to feel comfortable with it in our life. And he says, but if you do feel comfortable. Hey, listen, he's not trying to beat people up. He's not trying to pull a, a, a woman taking the act of adultery and embarrass her in front of everybody. This is a warning. He said, if you do keep practicing sin and you're okay with that, you need to check your DNA because you're not of God. You're of the devil. You say, preacher, are you sure? Verse 10. So now we can tell who children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not practice living a right life and does not practice loving other believers, in case you wonder through the other six verses, they do not belong to God. I mean, this is not something that should make us mad or angry or frustrated. This is something that should make us run out there and say, I want to be more like you, God. Oh, you got my seat. You got my seat. Well, great. I am so glad I'll sit up here. It doesn't matter if I have to go to the front row. That's great. I'm just glad you're here today. Oh, my goodness. It's so good to see. Oh, you know what? You've been talking bad about me. I've heard you've been talking bad about me. But you know the truth is, I've got a lot of issues I'm dealing with. So I appreciate you being concerned enough to talk to someone about that. You go, that is crazy acting. You're right. It is crazy acting. And if we watch the life of Christ in the New Testament, He had some crazy acting ways too. He healed the demonic man. He touched people that were so ridden with skin disease that everybody else ran from them. And He loved on them and He kissed them. And He proved time and time again that it wasn't about Him. It was about us. And if we really have a love for God, then we're going to love His people, sick, diseased, filthy, ungodly. We're going to love them all. And when sin comes into our life, we're going to hate it so bad that we can't wait to pull over on the side of the road and say, God, get rid of this junk in my life. That's what it means to be a Christian. You know what we've taught? We've taught it means to be a Christian. You go to church on Sunday and you sit down. When the preacher says, stand up, you stand up. Sit back down again, you stand back up, you shake somebody's hand, you go home. That's what it means to be a real Christian. That is not what it means. Being a Christian means that you act so much like Christ, people accuse you of it. I want part of it. When I've been praying for revival, I'm not praying for another speaker to come in. It's not even a numbers game to me. I'm praying that God would do something so drastic in our spiritual life that we would love Him so much, that we would act like Him so much that people would be enamored by the way we live and want the same thing. And that only comes through a personal relationship that causes us to act like Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your words. Thank You for Your teaching. Thank You for loving us when, God, we keep on sinning sometimes. And then You convict us and You, you allow us to hit these 
stumbling blocks and you allow us to hit these little pitfalls. And Lord, we find ourselves in an embarrassing or difficult situation because we've ran from repentance and you give us grace. Not because we're getting away with it, but because you love us. God, if we are truly of you, when, when we sin, you're going to call that out of us. Oh, it may stay in there for a few days or a few weeks, and God, your grace, it may stay in there for a year or so. But you're going to call it out of us, Lord Jesus. It may be through a still, small voice of the Holy Spirit say that doesn't belong here. It may be through someone else. It may be through a circumstance. But you're going to call it out of us because it doesn't belong there. Lord Jesus, my prayer tonight is if we keep living in the sin and the sin no longer bothers us, we've not heard you call it out of us that we would just do a, a DNA check. And we would ask you to be our Father first and foremost. God, we want to be like you. We do. We want to act like you, Jesus. We've acted like the world long enough. Father, we want you to shine in our life in Christ's name. Amen.